Welcome everyone to the Fermentation Association's webinar of Cider 2020, the state of the art of cider making. I'm Amelia Nielsen Stoll, editor of TFA. We are a trade group that was launched to support producers who use fermentation to create delicious and often healthful food and beverages. Our goals are to help educate consumers about fermentation and its benefits, support scientific research into those health benefits, and work with food safety authorities to establish clearer and more appropriate regulations in regards to fermentation. Today, we bring you two great speakers, Kirsten and Christopher Shockey, authors of the new book, Cider Making. Kirsten is also on TFA's advisory board. We have many questions already submitted and reviewed with our speakers. If there are additional topics you'd like to see addressed, please enter them in the chat below and we will try to get to them. We'd also like to thank today's webinar sponsor, Story Publishing. All right, Kirsten and Christopher, I'll take it away. Okay, we're gonna share something with everybody. And Amelia, let me know if you can see that. Looks good. Okay, great. So welcome everybody. We thought we'd uh, we'll just kind of frame up what we're going to talk about here in a minute. But first, we just want to get to know everybody and explain a little bit about who we are. So Kirsten's going to go drive there. Um, like you know, we're Kirsten and Christopher Shockey, and we live on a um, small holding in the mountains of southern Oregon. We've been here for oh, 22 years now. Um, and really our fermentation journey, passion, whatever you want to call it, started, started here on this place. Um, the photo you see is one of about, um, let's see, about seven or eight um, century plus apple trees that are on the, on the property. This one is a Cox orange pippin. And um, yeah, cider, cider needed to happen because after that very first year when we had bushels and bushels and bushels of apples. These trees are huge standard trees. Um, you know, there's only so much, so much uh, dried apple rings and applesauce and apple butter that you can make. And so we um, bought a cider press and the kids were little at the time and it was wonderful to bring the neighbors and all the kids and just press cider and you know, drink it as it came out of the press. And we froze a lot of it for fresh drinking um, throughout the year. But honestly, the best way to preserve that apple juice, at least for the adults, is to ferment it. Um, and so cider has, even though we, we've been doing a lot of other things, cider has been part of our fermentation journey um, almost, almost since the beginning. Um, so that's, that's the... This is where we are in this tiny corner in, uh, in Southern Oregon. Um, this is Key Mountains, uh, right there. So as you can see from that uh, screenshot of Google Earth, we are surrounded by forest. If you hike up and back behind our place and hit some of those roads that you see, we can just walk to the Boundary Trail, which takes us right to um, the Pacific Crest Trail. And we, we've joked sometimes we've, we should walk the Pacific Crest Trail from uh, backwards from Washington or from Canada home. Um, so yeah, uh, Christopher put some nice fun facts about our place. Um, we have uh, two seasonal creeks, uh, gravity free, feed spring. We're pretty lucky, lots of water um, in so uh, for the first year this year, we're seeing um, two of our ponds really go from being usually full to almost just a puddle. Um, we saw our gravity feed spring dry up for a few hours for the first time ever. Um, it's uh, considered poverty with a view here because the land is really made for forests. It's not made for, for all the, <laughs> the other things that that folks like to do on land, like grow crops. That said, apple trees grow really well here. So that's been a really good thing for us. Um, a number of years ago, we thought we were gonna be a cidery um, and we 
crafted a number of heirloom apple varieties. And so we do have a, a cider orchard as well. Um, we love perennials, um, we're on a hillside. And um, yeah, soil building is, is really one, one of our biggest goals. Sequester that carbon with microbes in the soil. <laughs> but instead of becoming a cidery, we ended up writing books <laughs> instead. Yeah, while, while we were building our space, um, our commercial kitchen to become a cidery, uh, Christopher also took a uh, cider making class from Peter Mitchell in Washington State. Um, and uh, we had the space and we were kind of moving in that direction. And while we were waiting for the apple trees to, to grow, I said, well, let's, um, let's ferment vegetables uh, for the local farmers, add value to their um, overages and their uh, seconds and things like that. And, um, and just use our space while we're waiting to be a cidery. So we started doing that. That became a little um, from a vegetable business. Then we ended up at market ourselves with our own products and really learned that people were fascinated and wanted to learn this. This was about 2009, 10, 11. Um, so from there came the, the first book and that really um, was received quite well and has changed our trajectory. Um, we decided we didn't want to be a product company anymore. We, we weren't going to make cider, but we really became passionate about teaching. Um, and uh, you can see there's been a few more books that have come since then. Um, this year, the big book of cider making. Uh, Christopher spearheaded that project because um, he's been our main cider maker here on the farm for, for all these years. Um, I am still excited about miso, tempeh, and natto, um, specifically natto, but we're not talking about that today. And I had a little chapter that might have been one fifth of the entire cider making book. One could say maybe it was that big. Um, I was thinking more, you know, fermented apples and all of their glory, um, but the Editor came back a few weeks later with the subject line on the email that said we need to talk about the vinegar chapter. Um, we talked about the vinegar chapter. In other words, the vinegar chapter went away and um, became its own its own book, which will be out in May. So I had to do a little plug for that because all good cider can become good vinegar. So is the other thing you can notice, I mean, back to uh, what you all care about is all of our books, we, we really have been partnering with different microbes. So lactic acid bacteria on the first two, um, miso tempeh natto was crazy. It was everything, molds, yeast, bacteria. And then with cider making, you really come back. Um, you've got yeast, they're your primary partners that you're gonna be using. Uh, some lactic acid bacteria, we'll talk a little bit about malolactic fermentation. Mold is not your friend. There's, there's just no place for mold <laughs> in cider making at all. So um, we're gonna to try to stay away from that partner in this one. And then Kirsten is uh, acetic factor, some uh, bacteria. So maybe there'll be a future one about um, vinegar, but not today. So, um, Thank you for all the questions. We had at least 124 different questions that came in from everybody. So, um, and, it, and it's a broad range. Um, everything, as Amelia said earlier, consumers, you know, general how to, um, all the way to what kind, of, what kind of apples are the best kinds of apples? What kind of yeast should I use? Um, how do I take my hobby to a big business? Uh, what's the best way to market and some market trends? And in some of those, it's really producers. So we have people on here that are master cider makers from some of the largest cideries in the United States. We have um, kombucha makers from all around the world. Um, so there's a big mix. So we had a little bit of um, test to see what we're gonna do. So here's what we're gonna do. We're both educators, so it's hard to let any question go um, we're going to try to focus on these four. So general how to then go a bit deeper. So if you're a producer, we'll try to get into a little bit of the deeper questions about that. But if you're a consumer just wanting to know more, we're going to catch you up on just like the basic technique. 
Um, if you've been producing a while uh, for yourself and you're really thinking this is the time to go into business, we're going to uh, cover that one briefly. And then if you're a producer and really want to make sure you get something out of this, we've got some market trends. We've got some data on cider specifically, Q1, Q2, um, that not probably not a lot of people have seen, and also specifically on what COVID has done to cider. Um, so stick around for that at the very end, because I think that's going to be a good conversation about really what, what's changed, what's happened um, due to, uh, you know, uh, quarantine and the lockdown that's uh, have happened. Um, and also, if, if you have questions, um, there's two of us. So I'm going to be kind of um, going mostly here from here on out. So if you have a question, Kirsten can also uh, address it in the chat or we'll stop and talk about it. I was going to say, uh, some of the questions uh, should we put in the, in the question box to answer in the Q&A later? Do you want to answer in the lab? Yeah. Or is that using your question? I don't know. Maybe, not. maybe just stick with the chat. Don't think about it. <laughs> so let's talk about making cider. Um, and what I wanted to do is um, let's just get out of the way, kind of like, what is cider? Because um, for most of the world, this is an easy question when we say cider, but for Australia and the United States, it gets a little more confusing. So the definitions we're going to be using today is cider is alcoholic fermented juice from apples. So cider, cider, most cider, apple vine. Uh, or hard cider even, these are all the same words for what we're talking about, which is that lovely fermented version of apple juice. Um, so when we say sweet cider, what we're talking about is the unfermented and likely unpasteurized, hopefully just pressed from juice. That's what we think of when we say sweet cider. So the differences between those two, and that all changed with prohibition here in the United States where, um, Sweet cider got the name cider, and we put on the label hard to just reinforce that it was something we didn't want the men doing and drinking. So um, we'd like to bring that back and really talk about cider like the rest of the world does, talk about cider or sweet cider. Apple juice is also unfermented, Can but mm -hmm. there's also, um, you'll see the term um, real cider or modern cider, and that's sort of getting into that space of what traditional cider is, is just apples. Like there's no other ingredients, no other anything, um, whether it's uh, fermented wild or fermented with cultivated yeast, it is just apples. Um, my, modern cider is a lot of what you'll see as different small cideries are you know, experimenting with what else can we do um, to have fun with flavor. And um, so if you have fruit added to cider or if you have um, botanicals added to cider or some something that changes it, that's that's what's considered in the cider making community, modern cider. Um, so do you need to remember that? Probably not, but it is, there is a distinction in, in a lot of people's minds. Okay, back to juice. Um, apple juice can be, it's not always pressed. So there's lots of ways to extract the juice from apples. And likely when you find apple juice in the stores, especially if it's in, not in the refrigerated section, it's been pasteurized and probably there's preservatives there. So that's an important thing if you're going to use, we'll talk about a little bit later, if you're skipping the apples and starting with juice, commercial juice you're buying at the store, that's one thing you're gonna wanna look out for. The pastures, Pasteurized juice is fine, but preservatives not so much. And we'll actually, in the deep dive, talk a little bit more about pasteurization and preservatives and how those guys work. So wine typically is the alcohol fermented juice of grapes. And we had questions that came in like, well, isn't, is cider wine and is wine, what is that? When we get to the definition of fruit wine, it all makes sense. So fruit wine is an alcoholic beverage made from fermented juice of fruit. So wine is a form of fruit wine. Cider is a form of fruit wine. The modern ciders that Kirsten was talking about where maybe we're gonna co-ferment two things together even, that's a fruit wine. Um, but not all, for example, um, not all fruit wines certainly don't fall into the cider or the wine category. So again, cider is really uh, 
somewhat specific to apples, wine, somewhat specific to grapes. And we'll talk about when we get into some resources later, um, a great way to um, get into a heavy conversation on the forums is to kind of open up this can of worms. So the cider process, whether we're talking about um, home first time or whether we're talking about, um, well, almost a strong bow making a million gallons of cider, the process is relatively the same. And so that process is basically juice. Uh, you gotta get to juice and that means good fruit. That, that's a concept of sweating. So we're allowing those uh, apples to set for a while um, to develop the sugars, which is really what we want all of those carbohydrates to be full sugars before we juice it, then we wash it, then we grind it, and then we press it. And um, we've talked a little bit in other forums about community ciders. Um, there's a lot of folks that are getting together, getting a press, and then going out and picking uh, apples that are otherwise going to waste. It's a great white way to deal with some of the wasted food around the country. And also cider makers are doing this as well. They're getting together and people are bringing apples, bringing juice, or excuse me, bringing apples to the cider makers. And sometimes they, you get a bottle of last year's cider in exchange, and then they make a batch that year, which is the communities. And um, so there's, there's opportunities you can get a hold of us later. Um, we've started trying to build a, a list of all these things that are going on, kind of a central place for people to find who's doing community uh, ciders around the country, around the world, actually. So um, that's something we can talk about uh, later. Okay, you've got you've got sweet cider. Now, what do you do with it? Now we're going to ferment it, which is what we all love uh, is fermenting. So what's the differences here? So if you're coming at this from a winemaker, or if you're coming from this from a beer maker, the difference is for beer, you've got to release those sugars out of the grain. So you've got that wart and you've got to cook things and you've got to, you've got to kind of break down those grains so that the yeast can get to the sugars. You don't have to do that with apple juice because uh, fruit wines, because it's right there. It will start fermenting immediately if the apples are, um, don't have a lot of fungicides on them, they're going to start right away um, fermenting anyway. If you're coming up from wine world, the difference is you don't have those pesky skins, which you can, you know, that's one of your main things. Am I going to leave it on the skins? Am I going to take it off the skins? All the skins um, are left behind in the pomace with, with cider. So we only have the juice coming out of that. And then your big uh, choices then are what kind of yeast are you going to partner with? And that's whether you're going to use uh, cultivated yeast or whether you're going to use wild yeast. And we'll talk about that when we deep dive a little bit here coming up. And then you go through primary and secondary stages. So the differences between those two and what you do have to do with those yeasts moving their way through the sugar and getting to the alcohol. So it's a very simple process. Um, Saccharomyces cerevisiae and other uh, yeasts are going to consume the sugars in your cider. They're going to produce CO2 and they're going to produce ethanol. That's why we have those little bubblers at the top to let that CO2 out. And um, there's ways of then measuring with a hydrometer or a refractometer. You can measure the sugars you start out with. And then that's going to tell you at the end, kind of a, a guess is how much ethanol you're going to come out the back end. After you ferment it, so now we're, the, the yeast have done their job, they've converted those sugars to alcohol, um, there's aging. You want to, you may or may not want to stop those yeasts from uh, producing any more CO2 um, and you want to age or not age. So we'll talk about that a little bit as we do deep dive. We're going to deep dive on all four of those. And then lastly, you're going to take that out of whatever you're aging it in, and it could be a 10,000 gallon uh, bright tank and you're not really aging it. It could be in beautiful old barrels. Um, and then you're gonna bottle it or you're gonna put it in a vessel of somehow, bottles, kegs, bag and boxes. We'll talk about this as well. And, um, and then we'll also, this will come in, this will be important when we talk about trends because there were some trends that we saw in how packaging was going on, especially for you and the producers that really got messed up when we hit to COVID. 
So let's see. Let's go deeper. So on the first one, um, we picked a couple of the questions here. One of them it was there were a group of questions around, can you make great cider with culinary fruit? Um, this is the kind of the question of, do I have to have cider apples to make great cider? And um, our personal answer and the answer from uh, a number of the cider makers that are friends of us is that you don't have to have true cider apples, meaning apples that have a component of tannins and sugars with them um, to make a great cider. But you, there are things that you need to do. So for example, um, in, the, in the West Coast, we have a lot, uh, in the Pacific Northwest, grow a lot of the culinary, uh, such as sweet apples that we uh, enjoy around the, around the country, around the world. And so when you buy you know, a gala, when you buy a Granny Smith in March, April, May, those likely were stored in giant uh, Pacific Northwest. Um, they were picked and then stored there. And so we can get juice. Cider makers in the Pacific Northwest can get really good quality organic juice from dessert apples fairly inexpensively. And so as a cider maker, that's good and bad. Um, the problem is that juice really doesn't have, doesn't have tannins in it to speak of. It's also blended together. So you're not getting character profiles that you wanna bring out. So if you're working with something like that, you, you really are gonna be thinking about that secondary fermentation adjuncts, what you can bring into it, as well as what kind of yeast, temperature, nutrient kind of triad you can set up to really bring out some unique flavors. People ask, you know, is, it, is the flavors always from the, uh, fruit, and it's not, it's also from the yeast uh, as well. So those are dials that you can turn as well as aging we'll talk about a little later. We had another question which was around pesticides in apples. And um, you know, if you don't know where your apples are coming from or you assume that there could be pesticides on them, you know, what happens when you are making cider? Does it change? So there's a little bit of research out there on this. Um, there's a couple of studies that are, are and it, somebody can reach out to me, I can point you to the studies. In both, one of the studies they uh, were tracing, in both the studies they're looking at insecticides, mostly for aphids. And what they found in the first study is that most of that, um, of those pesticides will, in fact, 93% will eventually um, trace out from, uh, so you no longer get it in the cider um, that they bind to the lees, and we'll talk about lees when we get to fermentation. Oftentimes, it also um, it is where they go. In another study, they added an insecticide to the cider, and what they found is that, again, they bound, oftentimes those insecticides, um, those chemicals uh, would bind to the lees, and also as the fermentation, less and less parts per million, until they got down to less than 2%, of the pesticides that were introduced with the juice actually end up in the cider after 56 weeks. So it does seem like in the cider process, there are a couple of mechanisms at least that um, deal with pesticides. But again, you know, fungicides are the biggest thing to worry about. Even organics, there's ways to use different fungicides that are being allowed. And also the organic standards have, in my view, been eroded over the last 15, 20 years. So, um, you know, it's something to think about for sure. Know your, know your apples if you can. Know your farmer that's growing those apples. Uh, so then uh, we're in fermentation now. So a couple of questions we wanted to get to there. Um, one of them is what changes, you know, in the process when you go big um, from home to commercial? And the reality is your recipes will change because you're making a lot more. Um, you're scaling up a little bit, but not a lot changes there. The biggest thing that changes there is having to do with, with um, temperature. So one of the biggest things you have to deal with, especially no matter what yeast you pick, is every yeast has a different range of temperature that they like, where they're very happy and where they're stressed. And when they're stressed, they stop doing what you need them to do. They produce things like hydrogen sulfide, which is a, a of a gnarly smell, not something you want. 
And so you want your yeast to be happy and you keep them happy by being in the right temperature and also having the right nutrients. So as you get bigger, um, if you're out, I talked to a cider maker yesterday and he's, he's fermenting in a tote. He's using um, Sauvignon Blanc yeast and the temper that yeast likes a pretty high temperature, higher than he has in his cidery right now. And so he's got heaters pointed at uh, this 120 gallons in a tote because that particular yeast wants something higher than the other yeast want. So it's harder to move the temperature in the more volume you get, it takes longer to move that temperature. The good news is if your yeasts are happy, they're gonna stay at that temperature likely because you have so much volume. We had some questions around citrus um, and hey, can I get citrus in my cider? Absolutely. What we do, um, and we adopted this from one of our cider making friends just up the road is citrus is a wonderful thing to add. What we do is in the secondary, so after most of the yeast have processed the sugars, and now maybe you've racked off into another container, we use the peels, the dried peels, and we drop those in in the secondary ferment. Um, it's a, I don't have a recipe specifically for that or percentages. It's really something you want to play with as a cider maker, start small and then scale that up. If you don't get enough, you're just not gonna taste it. If you get too much, you're gonna start to get those bitter notes. And so um, you'll know when you've put too much grapefruit um, peel in your cider, cause you're gonna get a bitter taste, not in a good tannin sort of way, but just in a bitter sort of way. In our book, we have the process for making uh, fermented lime um, from Middle East called lumi. And that you're fermenting it and drying it out. It's called black lime also. And we found that makes a really nice um, citrus and cider too. So you can really play around with, with that kind of process too, maybe on some of the other citrus. The other option is, and then all the adjuncts, is to, to steep and make a tea and you can control it that way. So uh, another way, whether you're um, adding oak later or adding an adjunct, some kind of flavor, is to steep that. And then now you have a liquid that you can then test that out. You can pull out a quart of your cider, you know, test, you know, um, a variation of I'm going to, I'm going to take a liter and I'm going to add this much, this many grams of that and get your percentages right where you say, yep, that's really dialed in and then add that liquid to your secondary. So that's a, a safer way to do it than um, just adding the dry. So that's another possibility. Um, aging. So can questions around, can you age cider like a wine? You can. Um, it doesn't mean that everybody does. So there are a lot of the producers that you get, once it's out of the bright tank, it goes straight into a can or a bottle and straight to you. And so there's no real aging that's going on. In other cases, and especially if you're buying a bottle that's maybe $30 or $40, they may have aged that a year or two before they even sold it to you. So, you know, it can depend. Um, cider is different than wine so there's a little more challenges that we have on the cider world than we do in the wine world in that and it has to do with um, the levels of our tannins what type of tannins there are as well as uh, ph as well as alcohol level um, there's a number of different things that allow a fermented fruit wine to age well uh, oxidation is a big thing for cider. That's why you, whatever you're aging it in, one of the biggest things I would say is try to keep oxygen out. One exception of that is if you're making a, a Spanish style and then you're gonna really wanna control that a little bit. I think we've got a, might have a picture in here somewhere of um, you know, these giant, giant, giant barrels that they age in, uh, we saw in this, uh, As Basque country and Asturias. But um, so aging, you can definitely do it. We'll look out for oxygen. Um, a lot of questions about how do you stop yeast? Yeah, so yeast don't want to share. I mean, that's the, they, they want the sugar. So if you want some sugar in your cider at the very end, you've got to stop the yeast at some point. And you can stop yeast really four different ways. You can make it too hot for them. You can kill them by heat. That's pasteurization. You can kill them by cold. Well, you can slow them way, way, way down and remove them. So that's cold crashing where you uh, basically use the cold to keep knocking them down and then removing them through racking. Uh, you can use chemicals. So um, various 
different forms of fight, which do a number of things. They also, they, pre they prevent the yeast from uh, reproducing and kind of neuter them. Uh, and they also choke out the oxygen. It's very cruel what happens there, but chemicals is another way that you can do that. So it's, it has to do with, are you thinking of using sulfites? Not, if you're wanting to do it natural, then you've got heat, but you want to be careful so you don't end up tasting like apple pie. So flash pasteurization, really getting to a certain level, minimum amount of time is really important. The last thing you can do is filtering and filtering is a little out of the range of just from a cost and equipment perspective of home cider makers, but certainly for producers, you know, you basically squeeze those little bad boys um, until and stop them at the, at the border basically. Um, so the yeast, you use such fine filtering material that yeast bodies can't pass through, but your yummy cider can. So those are different ways that um, producers and consumers or producers at different levels can do that. There's a question that's right in there. Um, I answered it a little bit, but um, you could. Mm -hmm. It's um, how do you preserve or add as much apple character as possible when back sweetening using unfermented cider, cane, corn, sugar, brown sugar, et cetera, which are typically ours ends up very dry and anything added doesn't make it pop like it should. So I talked a little bit about the stopping the yeasts but yeah so back sweetening so the question is back to those yeasts want to uh process all the sugar so if you want a sweet cider at the very end you can kill the yeast before you move to this stage and putting them in the bottle and then you uh depending on how you kill the yeast if you like we talked about don't damage the flavor uh examples of too much chemicals and you you can get things like geranium taste um, too much heat, you can get a cooked apple taste. But let's say that you got through all that or you let it go very dry, which I think the person's talking about. And then the sweetness that you bring back is, is pretty dominant, can be pretty dominant. So what can you do? You know, you can do things. Some people will then treat, very lightly treat that juice. They'll add the juice back, some of that juice back, but it has the flavor profile but they want the sweetness. So they're also gonna add sulfites to that uh, to basically kill any natural yeast that's coming in or they're gonna pasteurize that juice first and then introduce it back in. Again, what they're trying to do is not have any um, yeast in the bottle. If you do want some yeast in the bottle, then you do a pet knot kind of thing where you're gonna have a few yeast and that the, the problem is the yeast are gonna process all that sugar for you. You can use um, non-fermentable sugar sugar that's not available to the yeast. I haven't had a really good success with that. I'm not a big um, stevia fan. Um, some people have had better success finding non-fermentable sugars that they can use. Um, the other thing to think about, and I think somebody kind of mentioned that too, is beside the sugar flavors, sugars will also leave some residue in, you know, some lees in the bottom of the, and, and maybe some cloudiness. So if you want something clear, you can think about more of a corn sugar, um, um, we use organic sugars. Um, honestly, we, we use a lot of different things to do that. So those are all things you can think about when you're back sweetening in that last piece. And then you're gonna put it in a vessel of some kind. Um, so hobby to business. We had a lot of people that had questions about hobby to business. So here's a URL. Um, this was one of the chapters in the book that got cut, which is really, okay, I've got this problem I'm making you know, founding fathers, 200 gallons plus, I'm sharing it with everybody. People like my cider. I think I want to go into business, leave my current job and become a cider maker. Um, that's a URL you can go to. It's a free just PDF from the book download. But what I walks you through is kind of that plan, launch and grow piece. Um, you know, we talked about scaling up your recipes. You're going to do that, that cider that people love. You're going to get bigger. Um, the biggest part is, uh, designing out your cidery, deciding if you're gonna work from apples you're growing, so you're really an orchard and a cidery business, or whether you're going to buy locally, you know, how you're gonna source, what that story is. And growing, a lot of people have questions about market, which we can't get to, but marketing has a lot to do when you're growing it, is like, how do you compete with all that other shelf space? So there you're gonna talk about, I would say that one of the biggest things for cideries following wine is on premise. So if you build a cidery, if you can build a tap room in a place where you can draw attention, just like in cidery, just like in the wine world, tap rooms have really become a 
huge source of revenue for cideries as well. Um, so more about that if you wanna go ahead there. And the last thing we want to talk about is market trends. Um, so a lot of surprises in 2020. So the story in 2019 was um, cider starting to go flat a little bit. One of the biggest issues uh, when you look at the categories between beer, wine, spirits, cider is always kind of pulled from beer, pulled from wine, not so much pulled from spirits. Then we had these pesky things that came up mostly last year called hard seltzer water. <laughs> and that one is really pulled from everybody, you know? Um, and so it's been a great, they've done a great job marketing to people think hard seltzer is like super healthy, super low in calories, super, it's like the best of all worlds. I can get my ethanol and pay no price. Um, the other place that we've seen kind of erosion a little bit of the market of cider is things like hard kombucha, which has really come on as well. Um, and again, in anywhere you can take a consumer and go for something they know, like kombucha, to something that they know, which is like, here's your kombucha, and now there's some alcohol in it. It's a really easy, uh, a, a good transition for the consumer, because uh, we had a lot of questions about how do I get people to understand this. So Q1, Q2. So in Q1, um, the off-premises, so this is, you know, um, I'm I'm not consuming it on premises. So this is not a tap room. This is not a restaurant. This is not a bar. What is this? This is, I maybe go to a cidery and buy a six pack or buy a bottle to bring away to drink at home, or I go to the grocery store or I go to Costco and I buy this so off premise. We're flat in Q1. Look what happens in Q2. Suddenly, boom, 11% up, especially for regional brands. What we've seen in 2019, 2020 is national brands, uh, have negative growth, but regional brands have had really strong growth up in the 30%, whereas national brands are kind of down to 1%. People asked, so what flavors? Uh, Q1 rosé was still pretty, pretty dominant, especially for regionals. Um, people are using red fleshed apples to do that, to really get a nice rosé look. Uh, sour is really still on and hot, as well as hot. On Q2, pineapple came in, so there's something about pineapple cider and coronavirus that seemed to have some kind of correlation. I guess we just need, we, we crave pineapple. Um, when that happens, I don't know. Q1, uh, we've seen this in general trend. Uh, cans have been really hot. So we've seen, you can see there a difference, a shift from bottles to cans um, in the producers. Q2, we saw bottles come back as well. And that could be just from what we're gonna talk about in the next slide, just sort of what happened here. Um, also in Q1, 12 packs were big and then six packs and then four packs, all you'll see that are within the cans. Whereas in Q2, we saw 12 pack bottles and six pack bottles. And really that's because of this, um, which you'll see. Uh, this is fascinating. So this is from a really large e-commerce uh, company that you can uh, buy cider on the internet. Uh, blues 2018 and reds 2020 and look at this so January February pretty much we're, we're we're following the same trend you would have imagined red with the 20 and then what happens in February lockdown start and look at the difference of what happened in cider uh, especially in that April May time frame and you see we're still up and my guess is as we go into the fall and we have kind of a repeat of March, April, people have already stocking up their toilet paper and they're also gonna start stocking up their cider. Um, you know, we see, this is kind of what we saw COVID March to June and then the future. So we saw hoarding of wine and cider likes toilet paper. What else do we see? Restaurants and tasting rooms their sales plummeted because of closures. Basically, people can't get there uh, to have on-premise tasting or drinking uh, because there's groups of people there. E-commerce and phone sales for cideries really went up in this time. So, and we've got this real interesting dichotomy going on. So cider sales are up over 12%, but when you talk to orchards, 
uh, farmers and cideries, especially small ones, you'll get a different picture. So a lot of our friends in the cideries are cutting back their production. They're not buying as many apples. Orchards like us um, are not finding, well, we, we use all of our apples, but small orchards, they're finding that um, cideries are cutting back the, their apples, apple orders. So you have this retrenchment um, as well as off-premise sales going on at the same time. <laughs> so, um, so what's this mean? Like looking out in the future, I think, especially assuming we are going to be still going through this or more than where we are right now, less business spending. So airlines, hotels, restaurants, conferences, you know, so those on-premise um, and if you're a cidery and or you have distribution and you are selling to these customers, you know, you've got to plan that in. We've had seen a huge home delivery shift. I mean, you can get your stuff instead of going to Costco. Why not just have Costco deliver for free same day? So we're, we're getting used to that as, as consumers having things brought. Um, and that leads to that last bullet point, which is the fight now as producers is share of their home refrigerator door, right? Instead of the shelf, we've, there's lots of ways now people are bringing can get to your cider, but you really want, to, now that you're fighting it out with what's gonna be in the refrigerator door when they go in to find a bevy um, versus all these things we've been just talking about. People's refrigerators not necessarily getting bigger. And so, you know, you've got shelf space issues there as well. The last one is this kind of mass migration from city to country, it reversed the trends. And if you have a job where you can work from home you're, you can now go someplace where you can buy a bigger house, less cost. And so you're seeing this migration of people moving. But again, that makes a difference for those of us that are worried about premises, because maybe now there's less people in, in our area that we're pulling from. So um, I wanted to kind of end here um, with more resources and really point people to things they can uh, look for. So. Uh, our personal favorite, starting in the bottom left, best podcast by far. Um, Rhea has been doing this for years and years and years. It is basically the Noah's Ark of everything cider. She's amazing. So Cider Chat, look that one up and just deep dive, go through it. You can find anything you're interested in. She's talked to somebody about that topic. Same thing, the Cider Workshop. Um, look that one up. It's a web resource, but really it's a Google group. And that Google group is, the, I think, the most active cider group anywhere. You've got really, uh, you'll see up, uh, Ben will weigh in, Claude will weigh in. Um, you've got um, Andrew Lee will weigh in. So really kind of like the, the grandfathers of uh, cider making all the way down to brand new people. My uh, having gone afoul a couple of times in this in this forum around this, what I would say is a lot of opinionated people. They try to be really really civil with each other about that. So I think that's a really good forum that way. Do do your homework, and when you drop in, likely what you're about to ask somebody has asked and probably asked multiple times over the years. So it's uh, you know just kind of avoid getting the. Um, do the search, look that up, look it up first and then ask a question based upon that and you won't get necessarily the wrath of old grumpy guys who uh, don't like to keep answering the same question. Um, I picked just kind of five books off our shelves that I think um, all offer something unique that I would suggest if you're really starting out here. Um, Emma Christensen's Modern Sire, it's a gorgeous book. Uh, she comes uh, from a a beer making background as well. So you see the use of uh, beer yeasts in a lot of, for us, she has a lot of recipes. So if you're a person that really likes recipes and maybe coming from the beer world um, or just looking at a visual inspiration, I think that's a great book. Um, ben wrote our foreword. Um, Ben's really kind of one of the founders or you know, just a stalwart in this industry. His book is in third or fourth printing, that one, uh, Cider Hard and Sweet. Great history piece to it as well. Uh, so I think that's a solid, solid book. There's that, that one in the middle, the only one that's got a bunch of flowers coming out of the cider. What's all that about? Um, then we've got Claude's book, the Cider Maker's Handbook. Uh, 
it will teach you things like if you want to build your own press, um, Claude also goes into the science, science, science of it. So if you really need to know everything that you can, it's a big book, it's a beautiful book, but he goes into detail, detail about things as well. He's one of also those really strong um, people in the cider world. So that's a great book to go. And then uh, Andy Brennan's book, which just came out last year, Uncultivated. Andy's got a great cidery on the East Coast. And I think if you kind of tend towards wild, kind of like what we do, as you can tell, um, that's another book that, you know, it's, it's more of a memoir as well. You're not going to get recipes in Andy's book, but you are going to just hear from a cider maker who's really trying to heal the land, um, build and build a business and survive the cider. So he's really kind of no uh, punches pulled what it really means to be a producer. And he's, he sold some of the most expensive cider uh, in the country. So he don't, don't think he's just making some kind of wild hooch. He makes some amazing cider that brings in a lot of dollars as well. Uh, and the last thing is, um, you know, if you've got questions, I put my email up there. So um, fermentationschool.com is where we do our online classes and you can reach me there. Um, we've got a cider class. We have a class now that uh, teaches you how to cultivate wild yeast. Um, we're launching a cider class next month after we get through all of our cider uh, filming that to be that. Just reach out to me too. I'm, I'm happy to help and point you in one of these different directions or, um, you know, if we haven't covered it already and just to try to keep this conversation going. And also there was, like I said, there was a lot of questions that we didn't get to on some of you. I'm going to try to reach out to you and just answer that question privately. Yeah, so we got nine minutes for questions. Amelia. Hi guys, thank you so much. You are just so generous with your resources and knowledge. That was a lot of really great info. Um, I have a few questions that we had pre-submitted. Okay, so first tell me about yeast. When making apple cider, do you prefer to use wild yeast from the apples? Are you using a store-bought yeast? Is there a notable difference in flavor? Sure, uh, I am a reformed commercial yeast person. I used to only use commercial yeast and then I uh, added a cider maker in the household who is beyond wild style. And now um, I have the confidence to uh, use wild yeast every, almost every batch, uh, every batch. So I'll only pull in a commercial yeast if I'm afraid the wild yeast aren't gonna do what I want them to do on the apples. Or if I'm trying to do something crazy, like I'm trying to really jack up the alcohol to maybe 16, 18%, produce something like a wine. And then I'm afraid that maybe the wild yeast aren't gonna be able to drink you know, stay at the table drinking that long, I might use a, a cultivated yeast that specifically can have alcohol content that high. But otherwise, I'm a reformed wild yeast maker for sure. Uh, but again, I'm not a producer and I'm not, uh, my livelihood isn't that every bottle is going to taste the same, but there are a lot of producers out there that do wild yeast and do a really good job. So I think it's really based on, on your personality too. Um, <laughs> some people really like the adventure of not, I mean, Apples are, are loaded with yeast. I mean, inside and out, there's just millions and millions of yeasts and other microbes on, the, on those apples. And traditionally, it was all wild yeast. You know, you just smashed it, pressed it, and, and that's what happened. Um, all cultivated yeast were once wild yeast because they did what we liked, you know, consistently. And so um, when I say personality, like some of us are actually really curious, like what's gonna happen? Um, and, and are fine with that. And, and some of us homemakers, obviously if you're in business, it's a very different thing because you can't take these risks. But if you're making small batches at home and, and you can take these risks then, and you want to, that's great. And if you don't want to, that's great too. That's why we have cultivated yeasts available to us. And you have this you know, sense that you've got a little more control of, of you know, who's doing what in them. So I think it's really just based on what you're looking for in your, in your project. <laughs> All right, what are your thoughts on back sweetening cider? Uh, so we wrote the book saying it's a big adventure. Pick what you want, no judgments. So if you like a sweet cider, 
by God, make a sweet cider. You're going to need to back sweeten it somehow because the yeasts are not going to give up the sugars without a fight. Uh, so you're just going to have to do it if you want a sweet cider at the end. And I would say, if so, then what we talked about a little bit earlier, you've got to make sure there's no yeast in the bottle. And then you have to pick a sweetener that you're going to like that taste in the bottle. So there's a couple of things you have to do that. So what are your favorite cider flavor combinations? Persimmon. We have American persimmons on. We just uh, harvested them yesterday. The persimmon cider, it, it has an astringency that just keeps developing in the bottle. When we talked about aging, it just gets better, I think. The problem is we drink them all before they get really, really good. So I need like a separate part of the cave which Kirsten monitors and I can't get into. You now we put persimmons in there because um, I think they would be great after two or three years. We've just never allowed one to go that long. Yeah, I also, um, like Christopher says, I've done a lot with playing around with capturing wild and stuff with blossoms. And um, mm. we made, uh, we've got manzanita here in the woods and I made a manzanita yeast. And I was shocked at how delicious um, yeah, was really it was good. in that there was this sort of small floral component, but it was like, Christmas spice too. There was cinnamon in the mix and, and honey. And this was just off of a few little blossoms. And so mm -hmm. I really like finding those, those unique flavors. Um, and that's really important because you can do that with commercial yeast. I mean, you can use Trader Joe's organic juice. Yeast or commercial juice. Sorry, juice, bring that home. So, you know, the juice itself isn't magnificent from cider but then you bring in these cultivated yeasts, right? And you end up with a cider that's just incredible. So if you're in the city and don't have apples or have commercial juice, you can still make something amazing by capturing that yeast. Okay, okay so Kirsten, you mentioned flowers earlier. Often on your, your Instagram, you include these beautiful looking ciders that have flowers in them. How do you know which flower species are safe to put in your cider? Um, yeah, I, they have to be edible. I mean, I'll, I'll like this, the ones in the woods, I'll do my research, <laughs> and make sure that they're edible flowers. I would never use something that it's just because it smelled good. <laughs> so, but I mean, around our gardens, you know, uh, lilacs, lavender, uh, you know, any of these flowering fruit trees, like um, we make a plum blossom that's amazing. You get actually these wonderful little almond notes in it. Um, so as long as, you know, you've done your research and it's a, you know, it's edible, it's, it's fair game. It doesn't mean it's edible like, like the way a nasturtium is edible, like you throw it in your salad, but you know, just, it, it can't be um, toxic, but yeah, it, that leaves you wide open for all kinds of things. <laughs> okay, so we had a few questions from people hoping to launch their own cider brand. Um, oh, nice. What do you think is the key to differentiating cider brands in a crowded market? Uh, a couple things, you know, um, choose what you are going to be, uh, what's going to be your thing. Um, so what I don't see a lot of, um, and I'm taking a, looking at the seltzers and why they've been so successful, you see things like a uh, low carbs, so, you know, take the time to really look at what are the carbs that are left in your cider. And maybe that's one of the things you're going to leverage is low carbs. I mean, people naturally just go to, this is my story. So story is good if you can differentiate there, but it could be that you just see something in the market that no one else is really pulling to all natural. You know, there's lots of words that people have just beaten over and nobody trusts them anymore, but, you know, look for those kind of things and, and really focus on we're gluten free over the beer people but we don't have that over the salsa people, the wine people. The other thing is, what demographic do you wanna go after? Wine is struggling so hard with millennials and Generation Z because they just think wine is like for, you know, boomers. So how do you make your cider something that, that whatever age group you're looking for, you know, you may have to do, spend all your ads on, you know, TikTok in, the, in that way and make it something that people are holding when they're dancing, right? to get that into that social stream. I think, um, I think cider's a great place to, like natural wines are, are becoming more and more popular, but you know, cider's a great place to kind of move in that space too. And, and people are looking for funky flavors. You know, they're, 
we are moving beyond just, um, I think the biggest battle cider makers have is just feeling like, um, you know, the, the wine cooler crowd <laughs> is, yes. is, is their crowd. So, <laughs> but I think that's changing a little bit. I think kind of people are looking for more flavor. And the other big, big one is you're going to have a tap room. Are you going to bring people and have that experience there, which, you know, ultimately if you can own, if you can do a cider club and have your own email list and really pull them in. So three or four or six times a year, they're getting your brand. You can lock them in for one or two or three years. That's money you know you're going to have versus just duking it out on the store shelves where a new store manager can decide they don't want you and they want somebody else and you use that short, lose that short uh, shelf space. So I'd say if you can do that. Um, one of the biggest things we saw is people were moving to kegs from bottles and then the pandemic hits and suddenly every, Everybody that has kegs can't sell. So we, we know cider maker friends are like reversing all that back and their cider clubs are actually keeping them afloat. So, you know, that's the thing that you own if you have people in that brand and, and you can reinforce that message. So the biggest thing I would say is if you're gonna launch, figure out how to do a cider club, figure out how to have those people in, you can reinforce your message and your branding and that kind of thing. Great advice. Okay, we got my last question for you. We got a question from someone wanting to know, so your books have so much deep content. How long does it take you to complete a book? <laughs> so, uh, you know, usually about three years-ish. Yeah. Um, they, uh, um, this morning I just sent vinegar away for the um, last time. I won't see it till it's book. <laughs> Um, that was the shortest one because it it started out as a chapter with the cider book but then if you add that into the cider book you again get that long so this is the first time in like six years or so that there isn't anything in the pipeline um, for me or Christopher and that's pretty exciting yeah so if uh, you know something that needs to be fermented and you don't know that there's a book send it to me not to her because she won't answer you but I will <laughs> um we're also happily married, which is strange because we write together. So the other thing, advice I would say is uh, we nearly killed each other in the first book um, and then it got better in the second book and then the third, fourth and fifth books, I think it's great. And that is that know what your strengths are. So I love research, I love science, I love the papers, I love that. I forget to write things down. So I tell Kirsten, this is a great piece of information and never makes it in the book. And she says, well, what about that yeast you were talking about? And it's like, I have no idea where that was. Didn't you remember? Kirsten is really good with putting flavors together that you would never imagine. I need a, I, when I make something out of one of our books, I go get the book and she laughs and I look at the recipe and I follow the recipe that I wrote because I need a recipe. So if you're a recipe kind of person, that's okay. Um, you may even use your own recipes. So we figured out a way to work together to where I make sure she writes down things. She doesn't say pinch. She says actual measurements. Um, she makes sure I write down things and we kind of hold each other accountable and we use our strengths um, and let the other guy fly their flag where it needs to be. So I'd say, you know, teaming is really nice that way. It's not as lonely. Um, we're about to go... Uh, the vinegar book is Kirsten's own project, so we're starting to branch out and not do teams anymore. But it's not because we don't love each other; it's just that. Um, no, he's just afraid of a seed of bacteria. I, a cider maker. I, I'm embracing wild yeast, but I still, yeah, yeah, and I, I'll probably end up being a vinegar maker commercially, just because that's the way it always ends up. But embrace your, embrace your fears. Playing to your strengths, right? Strengths and fears. <laughs> yeah. Well, we received a lot of really great, great questions. We did not have time for all of them. I am going to, Christopher has generously offered to answer questions over email. I put his email back in the chat again, um, if you would like to reach out to him. Thank you so much for attending today's webinar. Thanks to Kirsten and Christopher for sharing their knowledge with us today. We will post a recording on TFA's website in the next 24 hours. We also have a number of great webinars coming up in the next few weeks, including fermented food trends with spins market data. Please go to fermentationassociation.org to check these out and to register. And while you're there, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Again, thank you for joining us today.
Bye, everybody. Thank you all for coming. Bye-bye. Bye, guys. <laughs>